So here we go again, round two. Yes, I'm still wearing the same clothes because we're going again. So I am Pete, also known as Risk for Rewards over on Twitter, and we are here for round two Sunday. You'll be pleased to know this will be much shorter. Same comments apply though, likes are much appreciated. If you're not subscribing, subscribe below. Just means you get the videos as soon as they go live. I haven't mentioned the Twitter or told anywhere else. Just means they just pop up on your phone on YouTube. Risk for Rewards made a new video. If the prices do tend to move, just means you get them first. So, without further ado, let's crack straight on. It is the Curra. It is another whopping day. I will say first, it is time stamped along the bottom. Time of the race, where the race is, um, just so that you can get there and you can go and have a look straight away. So, 2.25 at the Curra, the Blanford Stakes. This is a race I'm not going to dive straight into because the horse I liked last time out was Elizabeth Jane. Went off a massive price and ran a screamer for Dermot Weld. Been slowly ticking along, um, but I'm just going to leave it for now. Back over the 10 furlongs. I just want to see what the ground's doing and how we get on on day one before I start diving in with that. Because Purple Lily looks an obvious favourite dropping back in trip. Um, obviously, if you got to me, goes well in the St. Ledger. It's a nice form boost for Purple Lily. Don't want to take two to one now and then say they have a little bit of rain or something. On to the three o'clock. So this is, it always looked a cracker, but it's ended up with an, a nice field. Solid field, I would say. Um, five in attendance. And you look back to 2017, Aidan O'Brien ran happily magical in September. Happily beat magical that day with September and 3rd. Obviously all Group 1 uh, winners in the end. So there's nothing to say that this won't be the same. And this is a monster of a field. Hard to make a case for exactly, but outside of that, the other four, you could obviously make a case for other all four of them. So Simran has done nothing but improve since Ascot. Um, and she's shown that even on ratings. She, she beat Betty Clover next time out back at Ascot, then went to Deauville, where I believe she was supplemented for the seven furlongs and she won mighty, mighty impressively. It's going to be very interesting. We're going to get to see the, the uh, Royal Ascot form tested because obviously she finished um, in behind uh, Fairy Godmother, whereas Bedtime Story obviously won her race by like 25,000 lengths, but it was the other, um, uh, the other, I think they were both over the same trip. Uh, Ascot seven furlongs. No, she was bedtime story won the seven furlong race, Simmering won the uh, came second in the six furlong race. So, what I'm saying is, if Simmering was to go ahead and win this race, then that would give you a collateral form of that fairy godmother is likely ahead of bedtime story, um, in her form ability wise. At the same time, Simmering is clearly an improving fillies and mares improve at different rates throughout the season. So, Simmering very interesting. Um, Obviously, the red letter uh, form with Lake Victoria. Red letter was beaten by Lake Victoria on debut. Um, Lake Victoria was going away from... Uh, red letter was coming back at her at the line. and Lake Victoria got first run. Red letter made no mistake next time out when bolting up. But at the same time, Lake Victoria travelled over to Newmarket and she bolted up as well. Both of them have improved. However, Lake Victoria on numbers showed a lot more. Flame and Stone in fourth went very close just last week. Um, I believe did. Um, Angelica Bay finished um, second since then. Um, Mountain Breeze obviously isn't a bad yardstick to go off, whereas I don't think she's exceptional. But her numbers are much higher than what we're looking at with Red Letter. Red Letter actually, but then again, it was the form. She could only beat what was put in front of her. She actually, on ratings, her best is a 93, whereas Lake Victoria is now up in the 105. And I'd say Lake Victoria is obviously the biggest danger, well, her and Simmering, to her stablemate bedtime story. So a lot will be made. I don't know what price bedtime story will end up going off at. Currently, Antipost was 8 to 11. And it was a field of like 10 plus monsters. You didn't know who was going to run. But it has broken down a bit and you're now looking at 11 to 10. That's a much more reasonable proposition. I could see her going off 4 to 6. I could see her going off maybe even money 11 to 10. I think the 11 to 10 is probably fair. A lot of people will knock holes in her form since. So she beat Giselle on debut, a horse we're waiting to see come out um, hopefully soon. A dark horse for the Oaks. Um, but then absolutely dismantled the field at Royal Ascot, was arguably the most impressive winner of the week, winning nine and a half lengths from Pentel Bay. Um, since then, she was impressive again when beaten exactly over the seven and a half furlongs. Um, and a lot of people weren't too impressed last time out when she was workman-like beaten exactly again um, recently. Um, she didn't show anything that she hadn't already seen before. Um, and that's why a lot of people were like, eh, is she not improving? Like as in showing that, Taylor made improvements she showed at Royal Ascot that and on on ratings she isn't because obviously she ran to a 110 at Royal Ascot when she was mesmerising 105 which is £5 lower next time and then another £3 lower than that so 102 so she's already showed £8 below what a Royal Ascot so you could say she's 
not going well she's going backwards technically on ratings as in or was it a fluke or like as in was she a, was she rated too highly on that impressive Royal Ascot win but at the same time you go off either of those two runs that she did last time the 102 or 105 well as I've already stated red letters best number so far having only had two starts I will add is 93 so that would still leave her with the best part of 10 pounds plus to find however Simmering and Lake Victoria have ran to 103 and 105 so she, so they're both there or thereabouts but at the same time, that still leaves bedtime story ahead. Even if she ran to her form of the, the start after Royal Ascot, she's still on 105, which is the same as these two. I just have this niggling feeling, the way Aidan O'Brien was saying last time out at the Curra, I think he left her plenty undercooked. I think they did, haven't been doing a lot with her at home. I think they've left her with enough to work with. And it was all about just getting the job done, getting the fitness into her more race experience. He loves to race his fillies and mares, especially his two-year-olds. That's why they go to the Breeders' Cup, because he doesn't see it as a lost opportunities. Even if they finish second or third or they win those races, they come back the next year and they get better and better. So... I don't, I don't see that as an issue. And I think, yeah, she was sent off 1-16 to 16 in the last two starts and arguably she underperformed because she didn't give Frankel-esque performances. Um, but I think it was all about getting her ready and keeping her going ready for like bigger days. And when the pot comes, this is a €236,000 race and it's obviously a Group 1. This is the races that they'll be ready for. Um, Aidan O'Brien's actually got a mixed record in this race. He hasn't actually won it in the last four years. But when he has won it, like I said, he's won it with love, happily, minding. He doesn't. He, do, he, he likes to send a good one to this race. So I would not be surprised. Obviously, we know Obviously, the other one is Fairy Godmother. Um, and we're waiting to see how she comes on. I am concerned because it's been a while since we've seen her. But Aidan has given an update, a positive update. But OK, yeah, it's 11 to 10. I think I would be on the 11 to 10 even money side. And I will probably take that once I get off here um, over the others don't get me wrong if one of the others wins I would not be surprised because obviously they're, they're so they've only had she's had four runs the others have had two or three but if you're taking on bedtime stories if you want to lay her I'd be laying her because of the opposition thinking she's got plenty to beat rather than the fact that I've been knocking her for her last time out where she looked workmanlike because I just have this feeling that Aidan O'Brien was all he was doing was giving her a run out I saw plenty of knockers off that run and I wouldn't be one of them on to the 335, the Flying Five Stakes. So there's two ways to look at this race. So one would be, has Brad Sell been gifted the nice draw again on the higher numbers with the pace in a, a large field? But the other side of it was, if you go statistically and you look back through the past winners, I would argue that the answer is no, because yes, you might have the pace. And Romantic Proposal was drawn in 13, um, three years ago. But outside of that, um, in the last, so nine of the 10 runnings, no horse above stall 11 has won. And only one has won in stall 10. All the all the rest were drawn stall eight or lower. So arguably her being out on 14, I know obviously that'll give her plenty of options. We won't know until we see the draw, uh, the draw bias basically. Um, and will we know it straight away? Because obviously, even though it's Champions Irish Champions Weekend, Saturday's at Leperstown, Sunday's at... Um, the current so you'll have to watch the earlier races um but i think believing could end up being on the better side of the draw and obviously she's drawn stall one but the hope is that she can get having watched back the previous races it should allow her yeah it's not like she's going to be pinned to a rail and she was so unlucky i backed brad sell at york obviously hum, not a humble brag at all it was the fact that i backed her purely on the draw and was she the best horse in the race no, I thought Believing was the best horse in the race. Came through late, but because Brad Sell had the plum draw, she got the job done. Or he got the job done under Holly Doyle. Could well be the case again. Maybe being drawn high is the place to be. But if it's not, and you go on the stats, like I said, drawn eight or lower, there is less pace for um, Believing to aim at. But I have gone back through, and Desperate Hero, drawn in two, is going to be prominent. Um, Stall four, Gossy, uh, Big Gossy, will be prominent. And you should get plenty of pace out of draw five Matilda Picot so I don't see a way where um, she's not uh, that believing is not going to get a, a nice run into the race um, from that stall if there's a really significant bias and the low numbers is the place not to be then obviously that's gonna be a problem but I'll be disappointed if believing can't reverse form with Brad Sell here despite being believing being three to one and Brad Sell close to seven to four six to four um, of the rest it's a bit like the sprint I said last week you could get any amount of these you could make a case for winning on their day. Um, but I do think there's still, there's two group one horses in here and they're the two at the head of the market. 
Um, so for me, it'll be believing, but I am going to wait and hold off because you could end up believing, could end up at four to one, could end up. At, I cannot. I could see believing ending up at say four to one, but I can't see her suddenly becoming like a two to one shot. So we'll wait and see. Um, like I said, there's a lot of racing on Saturday to go. I will put my final selections up for Sunday. Um, but whereas I said, I'll take the price on bedtime story. I'm not in a rush to take a price straight away on believing. So the Vincent O'Brien seven furlong um, group one uh, for the two year old. Um, this is an absolute monster of a race as in, in the past, like I'll read out the past winners of this. Henry Longfellow, Al Riffer, Native Trail, Thunder Moon, Pinatubu, Quarto, Churchill, Air Force Blue, Glen Eagles. We're talking 2000 Guineas winners. We're talking about champion two-year-olds. This is a monster race. Charlie Appleby's won it three of the last six years with Quarto, Pinatubo and Native Trail. I believe in, I don't know about Quarto, probably could have been, but Pinatubo and Native Trail both ended up champion two-year-olds. The only concern with this is the, the horse that was always going to this race was Notable Speech. So either he's underperforming at home or Amori City's maybe shining more at home or or Notable Speech has had an injury so they've switched him to here. Because at the start of the week, Amori City was entered here and Goodwood. But they've decided to supplement... Sorry, he wasn't entered here. They've decided to supplement, I believe, for this race instead. Um, Henry Matisse was incredibly impressive last time out. My concern with him is that... He's still very babyish. He's doing everything right, but he's still very raw. Like he went through the race. He only did enough. Um, and when he felt the whip, he jinked. And it, Ryan Moore was like, whoa, hang on a minute. So it would not surprise me. And then when he hit the front, he only did enough to get the job done. He beat the striking bike in the timeout before that. That form has not been franked. But he's beaten everything that's come in front of him. His numbers are good. He visually looks impressive. And he sets a huge standard here. Two ways of playing it for me would be the fact that obviously you can back him as a win shot, but he is around the even money. I'd look to see what other races he could be going in. So maybe for him to win this race and then something else further down the line. Because the winner of this will obviously go on to bigger things. It's interesting, Hugo Palmer's decided to use Oshin Murphy and obviously send Seagulls 11 to this race. Um, so... Did I say notable speech? Yeah, I think I said notable speech. What I actually meant was ancient truth was supposed to be going here. Yeah, effectively Appleby's best two-year-old um, in behind I don't think any of them set a significant standard um, that obviously the front few can't match Coward of the County had been a bit disappointing for me um, but stepped up to seven furlongs bounced right back to form um, and I believe I think the horse at Coward of the County beat won again recently yeah won last time out last weekend so that form has been franked already but for me the indicator that I like maybe Maybe Appleby doesn't have that good of two-year-olds. Maybe the issue is, is the fact that um, uh, Ancient Truth has had a setback and that's why he's not here. But Amori City being supplemented for this race, 5-1 to one currently with William Hill, it looks potentially an each-way bet for me. I'm going to think on it, um, but I will put up whether I've backed it tonight with my Saturday selections because that's one that a bookies can take an easy clip on and 4-1. to one. The other thing is, as well, is if Wolf of Badenoch goes well, so in the Champagne Stakes of the 150 and Doncaster, if Wolf of Badenoch wins that race, then Amori City's price is going to crumble for Sunday. Obviously, I'm hoping Wolf of Badenoch doesn't win that race, but if he goes well, then obviously it's a, it's a nice positive. If you want a collateral double, you could always go Wolf of Badenoch and Amori City, because obviously if he was to win, it's going to be a big pointer, because Amori City hit all sorts of trouble in running and bolted up that day. Did finish behind Whistle Jacket, but improved plenty for um uh for the outing and was very impressive at goodwood um so looks the each way play for me i think i'd rather back five to one each way amori city than back henry matisse um at, at even money so that would be the play for me and on to the big dog the goat and that is obviously you've got to enjoy it and that is none other than kiprios i mean they were pushing him out all week as usual I don't know what it is with stayers, the bookmakers, because they don't win impressively. They don't do they they do they don't see them as a sexy horse. Like if you had a Baid who wins like say eight races in a row, they end up like one to four, one to seven, one to eight. But whatever it is, it's exactly the same as Stradivarius, and now it's the same with Kiprios. You're like, why each time is he getting sent off at these prices? Like he went off at uh, two to thirteen and one to twelve on his debuts, but then at Ascot he was backed in. He went four to one like anti post, and then he's all the way into. But he's still got eleven to ten. And then last time out at Goodwood, 
he was something like one to three or one to two or two to five or whatever um, in the lead up. And then he ends up getting close to the time. Then he's like one to two in the morning. And suddenly he's eight to 13 and he wins by four lengths plus beating Sweet William. And Sweet William, none other than today's winner of the Doncaster Cup. There's your form boost straight away. Um, and again, this week he was getting pushed out. So he's like five to six, 10 to 11 before the decks. So they've just reopened him again and he's now eight to 11. But as other bookies have opened, he's now four to five. For me, I think anything four to six or bigger is is a play for Kiprios. Um, like you, you just know what you're getting with him. He's looked as good as ever. His RPRs are massive. And I know the, the only thing that I'll say here is he isn't weaker over a shorter trip, so over one mile, six furlongs. But there's other horses that do enjoy that short trip. Like, this trip is tailor-made for Vorban. Like, I don't think Vorban, like, I know he's going to end up going to um, the uh, Melbourne for the um, Melbourne Cup. Um, and I don't think the two miles is perfect for him. Like, he was travelling all over the field at York. But once he hit the front, I don't know whether it was him idling when he hit the front or whether it was the fact that it was a two-mile trip. But once he started getting pushed off the bridle, he scrambled home. Um, so I, I, I don't I don't know. But he will like this. He will enjoy this uh, step back to 14, 14 furlongs. Um, but my question mark for him is, obviously, he was getting beat by the likes of Tower of London. He got smashed by Kiprios last year. I know, again, over the two-mile four furlongs. So he's got plenty to prove. Vorban also was beaten by Giovalotto. The other thing as well with Vorban is if Melbourne Cup is the plan, I don't know the ins and outs of how it works with the handicap marks for Melbourne Cup, but if he was to go and win this, say he did beat Kiprios and Giovalotto, he's going to get like another three, four, five, six pounds. His chance of winning a Melbourne Cup, considering obviously you'd think they'd be trying to get the mark down, not up, because he's already gone up three pounds um, and he'll be back off. He ran, I don't know what mark he ran off last year. Um, but I think he was about 114 and he's now 115. So unless he gets it back down, again, they're just relying on him being a better horse or run more to his level. So for me, this this trip will suit Vorban a lot better. Um, Giovalotto has been a revolution, a revelation this year. Much improved. And when I say much improved, it only takes a couple of pounds in the staying divisions to look a monster. My question mark would be, what's he been beating? So as I've just said, Vorban who was running on his return, and then he beat Arrest, who I think is one of the biggest not interested horses in training um, in a finish. And in fourth that day was Hamish, who again is a horse that's gone downhill. So whilst he's been impressive, and he's definitely going to put it up to Kiprios, um, I just I just can't go against the GOAT, in all, in all honesty. I think he, I'm, I hope he wins this. I hope they then straight... Obviously, I've backed Trawler Man for Champions Day, Ascot Champions Day. So I'm hoping straight after this, they say he's either going to France for his last run of the season, or that's it, job done, and he's off. he'll be back for Ascot. He's still 4-1 to one for Ascot for um, next year in the Gold Cup. And obviously, I've put that up and said I've backed that. In fact, let's see if we've got any specials while we're on the line. Let's see if we've got specials for that day yet. Oh, let's have a look. Kiprios and the long distance cup. Oh, Kiprios in the Ascot Gold Cup. So he's 11 to 2 to win on Sunday and to win the gold Ascot Gold Cup. That's not a great price unless he gets sent off 1 to 2 here, which I would say that's not a great price. Um, so for me, uh, yeah, Kiprios. I, I haven't backed him. I'm going to wait and see. Obviously, I'd hope that he, he drifts a bit. I would not be surprised if Giovalato come there travelling and Vorban both come there travelling all over him. Um, and he finds more under pressure. Don't get me wrong. They're horses. They're not robots. He is getting older. Maybe he finds a way to get beat. Because I think the big thing for him as well is that he's got such a dominance. It's so hard to be so good over two mile four furlongs. And there's only really him and Trawler Man that are that good at the Ascot Gold Cup trail uh, trip. So I think he's outstanding at that. And these horses will have a better chance of, of getting him here. But at the same time, I, I think he looks as good, if not better, than any other season. Um we know that he's got no issue going on good ground, good to firm, soft ground, doesn't matter. And I'll be disappointed if he gets beaten. And he's a no-brain, obviously, to say a nap. He's short price, um, but I do I, I do think he'll get the job done. So, quick summary of the Sunday at the Curra. Uh, 2.25 sitting on my hands. Bedtime story, we'll be taking the 11 to 10 slash evens. Uh, wouldn't put you off a double with Kiprios. Um, uh, the Flying Five. Uh, I prefer believing over Brad Sell, but waiting on the uh, see how the draw bias runs out uh, comes out. And Maury City five to one William Hill each way. Uh, that'll be the play for me. Um, and then the four forty five, obviously Kiprios. Hopefully the goat can keep keep going. 
Um, at the end of the day, though, I will say one thing is this is a mad weekend of betting. So there's like, I don't know, 20 group races or whatever. If you've had a crazy day, it's gone like this up and down and you're, you've like you're behind or whatever. Like All I can say is I just wouldn't be going mad like I said, piling into Kibrius or whatever. Obviously, I hope and think that he will win this race. But it's so easy when a horse is a really short price to just start throwing crazy money in it like an almost like a, a win it all back thing and it's just not something i'd advise but at the same time i do really hope he wins so we fire over to france so if you're tuning in this is a long champ baby so here we go as you can see i'm pretty hyped for this weekend especially as i'm going to be on track and i love going to the races it's not all about staying at home sometimes right then over to long champ so this is obviously more watching than betting but at the same time you need to be ahead of the game with regards to the big races. So one straight up is continuous. So continuous in the pricks foy. So first I'll say feed the flame has just not been a horse that I'd want to have on side. He's got blinkers here. He's not been the horse of last year. He could bounce back. But again, a bit like my comments earlier on uh, with regards to um, the horse that may well have won by now, if you're watching this on Saturday night, um, Kinross. Like you can't back a horse at short shorter prices when they're getting beat. Um, so feed the flame has shown me nothing. Irisine is much more consistent and is a big player, and his numbers are strong. And the same with um, Sacred Spirit's not a bad yardstick either. I just really like Continuous as a horse and a project. And maybe they won't have him cherry ripe for today, but they've been bringing him along slowly. Obviously, Ascot too too short a trip over the twelve furlongs, first time back. He travelled into it, sent off 13 to 8 favourite, travelled into it well, just didn't find a lot. He was only beaten six lengths. Had no right to be winning over 10 furlongs because um, I just think he just wants a much a much stronger test over the over this 12 furlong trip. Um, and obviously, remember, he is a ledger winner from last year and, um, and he loves a bit of juice in the ground. Currently, it is very soft, that long shot. So he's going to get very soft and 12 furlongs. My only concern is, as I've said, both every, not just, it used to just be the French, but now the English and Irish are doing it the same as well, is you often get a lot of shocks on these days. So like last year, I'm just going to go through. So Irisine was beaten in this race last year at one to two favourite, um, having won it the, the year before. Sometimes you get horses like a vowed geist who comes here, bolts up, goes to the arc, bolts up again. Wham, bam, thank you very much. But at the same time, you also, Aidan O'Brien might have left this horse at 85%, 90%. My instinct is that I don't think that's the case. I think that he's 12 furlong form. Um, I think he's had his prep run. He's had his proper prep run, which would have been last time out over the shorter trip. 12 furlong, soft ground, this should suit. He's 8 to 11 here. I do think he's got a nice outsider chance in the arc as well. Um, the arc obviously is made up. There's strong at the front. There's a big gap in the middle. Like the likes of City of Troy and stuff like that are sat in there around like eight to one. And they've got no, they're not going there. He was only beaten three and a half lengths on um, rapid. Well, it wasn't rapid ground, but deep, it was fast enough ground considering it was class good to soft. But all the two-year-old races were coming back like pretty much not far off course records. So I think on if they get soft the ground as well, and considering he'd already won the Doncaster St. Ledger, we knew he stayed the, the further trip. St. Ledger horses don't have a great record on this. And he ran a screamer to finish fifth um, last year. So he's got another year on his back. And I just think he's a nice dark horse to have in the race. I don't know what the price is to compare it against for the arc. But I'm looking here and he's 8-11 to 11 to win on Sunday. Um, and he's 28-1 to 1 to win Sunday and the arc. So if he's... If he's like, say he's 25 to 1 to win the arc, then obviously this isn't a great bet. But I've got a feeling he's around 16 to 1. So if he's sent off eight, between 1 to 2 and 8 to 11, the 28 to 1 appeals. So I'll probably take that. I'll probably have a 28 to 1, him to win this and to win the arc. He's 8 to 11. And again, if you want to have a small multiple, obviously you can see them all racking up at the moment. Like him and Kiprios, something like that, I wouldn't put you off. But as I've just said, don't be surprised when horses get beat in this and then they go on to win. Like I could easily... I've got the sort of punting mentality now that if Continuous ran a really great race, got beaten this, yeah, your 8 to 11 bet comes down and you double up to win the arc goes down. But he could go from, say, 16 to 1 out to 33s. And I could be like, do you know what? I still want to back him for the big race because you have to be thinking about the bigger races still. So in summary, Continuous at 8 to 11. If you like short prices, I wouldn't put you off it. Um, and the 28 to 1 for the arc. 
And that's with William Hill, for anyone who's wondering. The reason I'm William Hill, I'm not an affiliate in any sort of way. It's just you have to take the prices that you can play. There'll be other companies that will go up close to the time, probably like Skybet, Paddy Power, etc., etc. But they've got them up already. So that's why I come on William Hill. On to the pricks for May. So this is the 257 at Longchamp. This is normally not the biggest field. And normally you have like one or two superstar performances. And then it, and that's it. You're like, wham, bam, thank you. Like Warm Heart won this last year. You had Tanawa in the past. You had Starcatcher. Like you had Trev. Like, but at the same time, to go back to my point again with horses getting beaten in this, Blue Rose Sen got beaten in this at four to five. And then I believe she went and won in, on Arc Day. And this is what I'm saying. Certain trainers use this as a trial. Doesn't mean you you can win and then win on Arc Day. You can get beat and then win on Arc Day. Remember, the Arc is only three weeks away. Arc Weekend is the 5th. That's when my website's launching for anyone wondering. So Arc, Arc Weekend is the 5th um, of October. So you're only three weeks away. A lot of trainers would rather finish second or third, pick up some prize money and not bottom their, how, their horse. So, however, looking through this Pricks for May field... I'm probably butchering that. Um, a lot of these horses are trying to book their tickets for the ARC. Big time. So I'm not going to say I'm a French expert. So there's a lot in the, of these French horses where I've watched bits and pieces of their form. Um, but there are standouts for me who I, I do want. Emily Upjohn, I just have not liked her at all at any point this season. Um, I don't know whether it's because of um, since the switch, obviously, with she's a tricky ride with no um, Frankie de Tori around anymore. Um or it's the fact that, uh, apologies, two seconds, I'm just going to try and um, try and find a price for this race. Um, or whether it's just the fact that she's underperformed as a, as a horse this season. But either regardless, she's just not been great. So Emily Upjohn, I wouldn't I wouldn't be back in. Um, to cut cut this, uh, to keep this short, Blue Stocking is one that, as I've just mentioned, is playing for her arc positioning. With Kalpana bolting up the other day, I think they're looking for a way that if Blue Stocking can win this or go incredibly close over the 12 furlongs on softish ground, she'll become an art contender, which means she can go here and they can use Kalpana, keep Kalpana for the Phillies and Mares on Ascot Champions Day. You don't really want to run Blue Stocking and Kalpana in the same Phillies and Mares race unless you're not 100% confident in that one of them can get the job done. So you don't want your two best fillies and mares running the same race so if blue stocking go very well here and book her place then it's a win-win for them it means they can use Kalpana for the other race on her own if she can't then obviously she'll go there her form behind goliath was brilliant her form behind city of troy was meh she was backed hard like she was 20 to 1 once the, she was declared into the race she was shortened into like 10 to 1 went all the way i think she was as short as 4 to 1 3 to 1 at some point she went off 5 to 1 but she ran a a moderate race she was only beaten by the horses that she was giving weight to um and obviously city of troy being one of them but on her rprs 118 119 119 110 so she ran like eight or nine pounds below form and she'd won twice and came second to goliath they were all really strong positive trends so she's looking to book her ticket and she would be the one to beat the two that I want to back are obviously it's made no secret. Everyone already knows Sparkling Plenty and Opera Singer, the two golden girls for me. And again, they're in the same boat. These two aren't horses. OK, maybe maybe they do go through here and then they're trying to book a place with a, a big, strong run. But Opera, Opera Singer is already entered in the arc. So she has as, as her chance. But if she doesn't go close here then I could see them skipping the arc and then going out to the Breeders' Cup over like a shorter trip, not going for the 12 furlongs. If she was to win here or go incredibly close, then I think you've booked your ticket. This isn't a, this isn't an easy field. If she if she wins this, then arguably you're the best 12 furlong filly slash mare going to the arc um, where you'll be getting the weight. Three-year-old allowance is massive. We know Trev's done it in the past and the other three-year-olds have done it as well. Um, I can't think off the top of my head, obviously, Golden Horn, horses like this. So... Uh, enable um, so if she can my concern with opera singer is that the way she was ridden last time out she was ridden for the 10 furlongs for perfection so ryan moore gave her an absolute cracker um, she didn't want any further than that she ended up clinging on by a neck under a perfect ride it's not to say she won't improve for the 12 furlongs she may be ridden differently i don't even know who she's going to be ridden by because obviously ryan moore will be over at the curra so it's going to be interesting the one that I've said straight after the race as well, that I backed at 25 to 1. So I have backed her at 25 to 1 for the arc. The other one I mentioned was the 25 to 1 on Sparkling Plenty. I backed her straight after the arc. 
She really, again, needs to win slash go incredibly close, like first or second, because the Yard have a huge share in the favourite already, um, who, the favourite for the arc. So she she needs to win here. And I'm just going to have a quick flick through to see what sort of price is. So Opera Singer to win this and then win the arc is 25 to 1. Whereas Sparkling Plenty to win this and then win the arc is 66 to 1. Yet both of them are around 5 to 1 to win this. Sparkling Plenty, I think, is about 20 to 1 to win the arc. And Opera Singer is about uh, 10 to 1 to win the arc. But of preferences, if I hadn't had a bet, so if you haven't got anything, then 66 would appeal to me for the Sparkling Plenty to win this and to win the arc. Um, and I'll probably have a small bet on that. Um, so, yeah, they both need to win, in my opinion. Sparkling Plenty needs to be supplemented. So she needs to at least get in the places to fork that money out for the supplementation, especially when they've got Look de Vega. They've got a huge share. The owners, Qatar, have got a huge share in Look de Vega. So they've got the favourite. They don't need to supplement Sparkling Plenty unless she shows something that, that she needs to be supplementing. But she stayed on incredibly well. She was held out out the back. She came wide. I don't think it was the best ride under Christian de Moro, um, and she was only beaten one length. She found plenty of trouble and I wouldn't be surprised to see the form reversed here. She's already got form on soft ground. Um, she's got form on heavy ground here in France and she's a hard one to weigh up. So blue stocking sets in summary, blue stocking sets a standard. She needs to book her ticket. The other two that I think believe need to go very close or win to book their tickets are Sparkling Plenty and Opera Singer. They're both around the 5-1 to one mark. There's only one bookmaker at the moment with the prices up. So they could end up being 8-1. to one. They could end up being 5-1. to one. Um, I'd be looking at those two still. Sparkling Plenty and um, Opera Singer. But the jockey booking is going to be very important for Opera Singer. Um, Sparkling Plenty obviously will have uh, one of the French jockeys. So that won't be such an issue. But I hope Sparkling Plenty, especially that 66-1 to one, to win here and then to win the... Um, arc i wouldn't be putting you off that again with william hill and then finally on to the pricks neil so the pricks neil is the 340 at longchamp and we get to see the returning champ uh, look to vega and as i said owned by qatar um, this is a horse that doesn't need to book his spot however the other caveat to that is do you like a nice sexy horse that goes to the arc four for four then wins the arc if obviously good enough, wins the arc, becomes five to five, and then and then they're like, okay, retirement. That's what they like to do. It's it's a nice sexy spot. You saying, oh yeah, but we didn't have them cherry ripe because obviously it was all about the arc. That's that's fine if that's your mo. But a lot of like it it does look nice when you go there with that extra tick in the box. Has gone there with a purposely built time off. So comes here last seen in June, so July, August, September. Um, Hasn't been seen for three months. Um, but at the same time, won easily after 162 days off previously. And as I said, we'll go for past winners of this race. Um, this, I remember last year, didn't a horse get turned over? Yeah, Feed the Flame got turned over at 1-2 to two in this race. Um, and you have had a lot of upset. Sotsas won this and then went on to win the arc. Cracksman won this, went on to win the arc. New Bay won this and then I think went on to win really well in the arc. But at the same time, Sotsas got turned over last year. Um, the year before Do Juice, but again that was the Japanese raider. Um, the year before that, you had Pretty Tiger getting turned over again. The Japanese, so the Japanese like to target this. So I wouldn't be surprised. But at the same time, this is no cakewalk. You've also got coming back from a short break. You've got Delius, who's been off since July, um, and then the other real standout is Sozi, who's also been off since the um, July. So Sozi won the race that Delius was in. They both. Delius was three for three, one in, and then finished behind Sozi. Um, Sozi as Sozi finished behind Look de Vega. So if all of these were 100% cherry ripe, then Look de Vega would be an absolute, not an absolute bank banker because obviously they all mature at different times. But the fact that Look de Vega has only had three runs and won pretty convincingly, like I'm not talking about it was a, like a a close call, like. Sozi did struggle for gaps in the race and you could argue was slightly unlucky but Look de Vega really did bolt up over 10 furlongs. It's hard to see this 12 furlongs not suiting especially on pedigree, Look de Vega at a high chaparral. Like, there's very little to knock. My concern would only be is how ripe, how cherry ripe has the trainer got them. You don't need to have your horse 100% if you want to have them 100% in two weeks, two or three weeks time especially if the ground's very soft. So for me if Look de Vega gets beat here, it's not like as in it wouldn't say, oh, you suddenly can't win the arc. But the fact that Look de Vega has already beaten uh, Delius and then um, 
sorry, beaten Sozi, and Sozi then went on to beat Delius. Sozi, it would not surprise me if Andre Fab of all trainers, he is one who's got no care in trials. So July, August, September, October, I'd actually be more surprised that if that horse was cherry ripe to win here. It wouldn't surprise me if that horse came on again. Only had two months off the track, so probably fitter than obviously an extra month that look the Vegas had off. Um, but again, as I said, these French trials, you see them all dawdle around the back and then if something goes from the front and just bolts in, then it's no surprise when all the others, they just trundle in behind and say, yep, thanks, nice little fitness run. However, again, another positive for Look de Vega is the horse likes to run prominently and will be there or thereabouts either from the front or pretty much making all. So, I mean, yeah, it's so hard to follow up. Basically, the trials don't obviously, a trial is a trial at the end of the day. I would either be back in Look to Vega or nothing at all. You can back Look to Vega to win this and win the arc at six to one. I think that's a fair bet. I think I'd rather do that. If he doesn't win this, then he's going to drift. Um, and I still think the horse has got outstanding claims for the arc regardless. Like I look back through the arc below and as I said, it's Look to Vega at seven to two. And then after that, there's a gap of loads of horses that aren't going to, aren't going to race. And then most of them are about 16 or 20 to one. So, right, let's have a summary because I know obviously I've gone a little bit here, there, everywhere with the long shot. So the 133, as I've said, these are trials. So if they get beat at short prices, don't be put off for the arc. However, continuous 8 to 11 and the double ups, what was it? I can't, let's get it, let's get it up. Continuous to win this and to win the arc is 28 to 1. I don't know what price he is to win. If he's like 16s or something like that, the 28 to 1 appeal. So I'll be taking that 8 to 11 and also the double up the 28 to 1 because I like his claims. He's got dark horse claims. There's a lot of dead wood in front of him. The two for me for the pricks for May, obviously for my art claims more so than anything else, there is a lot of uh, good horses in here, but a lot of them will be trialing for the arc. It's Sparkling Plenty and also obviously Opera Singer. If Opera Singer doesn't go close here, I think she'll be Breeders' Cup Brown. Sparkling Plenty, if she doesn't go close here, she won't be supplemented. Blue Stocking, 100% the one to beat. Um, but I do think she'll find one too good in the arc, so she wouldn't appeal even if I was backing her for the double up. So the two for me would be Sparkling Plenty and Opera Singer. The price on Opera Singer to win this and win the arc is poor, but Sparkling Plenty to win this and to win the arc at 66 to 1 makes appeal. So I'll back Opera Singer and Sparkling Plenty win only, and I'll also back uh, Sparkling Plenty to win this and win the arc at 66 to 1. The Pricks Neil, so the 340 at Longchamp. I would either back Look to Vega 11 to 8 or just sit on your hands and do nothing. Um, or Look to Vega to win this and to win the arc at 6 to 1. That is the bet that I will place. Six to Look to Vega to win this and to win the arc. If he runs really well and doesn't win this, then I can't see how he's not going to get bigger than 7 to 2, which means it could be 5 to 1, 6 to 1, which means then you can decide whether you want to back him for the arc anyway. Did he run well enough to justify being that thing? But it would be no surprise for him to win this. And then if he wins this, he'll be likely very similar to Ace Impact when he win, he goes off 5-2 to two arc favourite. So in summary, I do think like you have to tread with caution with your stake size. But I do think it makes sense to still back the horse you think that will win the races. But as I've mentioned as well, last year... Three very short price horses all got turned over at boil over prices like one to two, one to two, etc. But at the moment, these prices aren't there. So you're looking at eight to 11 continuous, five to one a piece for the two um, fillies and 11 to eight for Look to Vega. I don't think they're particularly bad. It is all your choice. So anyway, that is a way too long summary of Sunday's racing. Um, I've been going for that long that obviously the lights changed, the sun's coming in and now I've got my shadow behind me. So I've talked for way too long. At the end of the day, I hope you have the best weekend, whatever you're punting. Um, I just take it easy. What there, It is going to be a roller coaster up and down. Some horses will win that you knew would win. Some horses will get beat that you really expected to win. So I can't, I'm not here to advise stakes, but just do what, whatever suits you. Good luck, whoever you're punting. Hopefully we can get the Doncaster over the line. By the time you're watching this, I may have already blown my bullets in the... Um, Doncaster and especially in the St. Ledger but hopefully not so good luck for whoever you are back in and uh, yeah as I said on the last video for if you've if you haven't watched the first video um, 
If you haven't subscribed, brilliant if you'd like to. Likes are much appreciated. Comments as well. Any comments? Who's your banker for this weekend? But also, I am looking at doing a few short anti-post videos from five to ten minutes long of things to do with anti-post. And my example was, what is an anti-post bet? Should you back win or each way anti-post? Um, what is the point in even backing anti-post? Why not just wait for declarations? Just a few things, stuff like that. If you've got a topic or an idea or something that you think would make a good video, a short video, throw it in the comments below and I'll have a good read and I'll see what I can come up with. Best of luck for the weekend and enjoy it.